yeah, let's get right into it. So this is a tale of two trash snakes. And this is, uh, you know, the short version is this is a, um, a little story about a week in the life of our backyard a couple a couple years ago, uh, which makes it sound a little boring, but it was it was a pretty exciting week for for us, especially as my partner and I, um, we founded Advocates for Snake Preservation together. So we're both really into snakes and you know, actually our little house in New Mexico that we moved into about three years ago or three and a half years ago now. One of the reasons that we moved there um, from our former city life in Tucson, Arizona, is that we wanted to have snakes in our yard. Not that that doesn't happen in Tucson. It didn't happen um, where we lived, like in town. You can get some at the, um, you know, on the outskirts of town, like most places in the southwest. But we we really wanted like wildlife right in our yard and to be surrounded. You know, we wanted to live in their place not have them occasionally like showing up at the the urban wildland interface um so we moved out into to rural southwestern new mexico near silver city and to to the spot that i'm showing you a picture of and for the first year um it's a beautiful place it was really quiet um and there were a lot of animals that showed up in our yard and right around it um and also just just lovely scenery um of course lots of rock squirrels that is not exactly what we were hoping to see um we got plenty plenty of birds um y'all are probably better able to identify the birds at the bird bath than i am we're still learning um the birds out there because birds are not our specialty but definitely have a pretty diverse group including a lot of wild turkeys that show up pretty regularly almost every day throughout the year which which are pretty cool for birds although they definitely are eating some of our lizard and snake friends um alligator lizards are one of the the initial highlights of the yard they're just um just just fun fun little lizards that would show up both inside and outside the house um, we also have a fair amount of crevice spiny lizard <laughs> crevice spiny lizards in our neighborhood. And we've had a few like hang out in our backyard for periods of time as well. Um, and even a mountain lion, um, not right, right in our yard, but close enough to feel like a backyard wildlife. And and this lovely little lady who's who we call Martha, she's an ornate box turtle and she shows up during our summer monsoon season every year is around for the rain. Always excited to get a handout, especially love strawberries and anything else red. Um, and then is is done when it's raining. And and all this was really exciting and well, not really exciting. A lot of these were exciting, some of them not so much. But you know, as snake enthusiasts and people who moved out there to live with the snakes, we were really disappointed that that entire first year that we lived at this spot, not one snake in our yard, <laughs> not one. Um, and then that all started to change in August of 2018 and actually right on August 1st of 2018. So that's the first the first day in our story tonight. Um, so snake wise, that day started off pretty exciting. We had this um, chubby little black nut garter snake show up under um, a piece of cover in our garden. And if you're familiar at all with black neck garter snakes, they don't normally have these bright blue polka dots like this one does um, all along his back. And those spots um, turn out, they're not on the snake's scales, they're on the skin. And when they're really, really heavy, so after they've eaten a very large food item or I imagine a very pregnant female who's full of babies would also look the same. You can the their body stretches out and you can see the skin in between the scale rows and it gives them this like blue polka dotted appearance, which is really cool. And this individual snake had eaten what we're pretty sure was a chipmunk um, just based on the size of it and who we know was in the yard. There weren't really any lizards or frogs or anything you would typically expect a snake of this size 
um, to eat that was that was this big. So we thought it was probably a chipmunk, which was which was pretty exciting. Garter snakes, not our number one species, but um, it still started the day off pretty good and it was about to get a lot better. So this photo is um, <laughs> not the prettiest. This was an old truck bed liner that actually came with the house when we bought it. And we specifically asked for the previous owners to leave it there um, because it's a, it's a lovely piece of trash to find animals underneath. Um, most people who spend time going out and looking for snakes know that one way to find it, um, given you know, given some conditions, um, one way to find snakes is by looking under pieces of cover. Now that can be natural cover like logs, um, or it can be unnatural cover like trash. And that's also the origin of the this presentation's name, trash snakes. I'm not referring to the snakes in question as being trashy animals or anything, but just they really had an affinity for trash. And the fact that we had we kept and then also like carefully placed various pieces of trash around our yard, I think has been really helpful in attracting these animals and um, keeping them around our yard uh, since since we moved in, um, at least after that first year, once once they started getting established. But the truck bed liner was one that we had a feeling would attract animals. Um, that piece of metal on the left side of the truck bed liner um, as well has had some lizards um, under it too. And so this was something that we looked under basically every day it was warm enough where it seemed like there could be animals out and um, some alligator lizards had definitely been using it. Um, but again, up to this point, we hadn't seen any snakes in our yard under this or anywhere else. And then on this magical day, here was not just a snake. So we already had one snake in our yard. So here's the second snake. And this is a rock rattlesnake, um, a male rock rattlesnake positioned next to a $5 bill so that if you're not familiar with them, um, this is this is an adult, but rock rattlesnakes are pretty small. Um, they don't get much bigger than hmm, maybe two and a half feet um, and, and real slim bodied. And this is a species that is not normally one of the ones found on that urban wildland interface. This is this is not your backyard snake. Usually when people find snakes and rattlesnakes in their yard, it's gopher snakes or bull snakes or western diamondback rattlesnakes or maybe Mojaves, depending on where you are in California, um, northern and southern Pacific rattlesnakes. But it's not rock rattlesnakes. Rocks rattlesnakes are these little um, montane rattlesnakes that just barely get into the U.S. and to parts of Western Texas and Southern New Mexico and Arizona. And they're way more widespread in Mexico itself, but they just barely get into here and they're found in these mountain ranges. And people come from all over the world to the Southwestern U.S. to see rock rattlesnakes. And people that live in, you know, in town in Tucson and Phoenix, like, drive and head into the mountains to find these guys. They're just, they're, they're a really exciting species for some. They're certainly gorgeous. And so to have one show up in our yard was just so exciting. Like not just one snake, but two snakes. And one of them had a rock rattlesnake, which I should add on a personal note, this was the species of rattlesnake that convinced me to stop studying birds and move from Kentucky to the Southwest to work with rattlesnakes because there's just, there's something about them. So it was super exciting. Um, so the day wasn't over. Um, we, you know, got really excited about that rock rattlesnake. I mean, we were already excited about the garter snake and then excited about the rock rattlesnake. Um, and we took an afternoon walk. And as we were walking around our house, we found this very large gopher snake kind of crawling around the periphery, another of my favorite species. And then 
man, just a few steps away from that was this eastern patch nose snake also around the house. And it's funny because August is is often when the, the monsoon, the summer rainy season really kicks into gear in this part of the world. Um, and so that that first week has always been prized by my um, partner, Jeff, as like the best week in snakes. And I think this is the first time for me that that has really lived up to its reputation because, man, I mean, this day um, and then as you'll see, the week that follows um, was super, super exciting. So that was day one. Now we're moving on to the next day. Um, so early, early that morning, not early that morning, sorry. Um, late that morning um, out on the patio in front of our front door, there's a, a dead lizard you can see in this picture. Sorry, not a great picture. <laughs> um, this is a, a whip tail lizard and he didn't appear to have any marks on him, was just laying there perfectly still. And um, this is something that we had seen before. So this is another, sorry, so many dead lizard pictures. Um, this is another lizard um, taken from a different place we lived about 10 years ago, um, also right in front of our front door. And when we saw this one, I remember thinking like, Oh no, what happened? And worried that I had like stepped on him or something and kind of moved him off to the side. And a few minutes later, this Western diamondback rattlesnake um, showed up to retrieve her lizards, or, or sorry, her lizard. And we actually got to watch the snake eat right in front of our front door, which was pretty cool. So when the, the whiptail lizard appeared in front of our front door and with the recent knowledge that there was a rattlesnake hanging out not too far away from that door, um, we left that lizard in place and basically like went back inside and just kept going out to, to check on the lizard, see if it was still there, see what was going on. And man, some time went by, a couple hours, I think that lizard was sitting there. Um, and then I went out to do another check and lizard still in the same spot. And then out of the corner of my eye, I hear, or sorry, I hear this little buzz. And then the corner of my eye, I see little, little gray tail with black bands slipping behind this coffee can. And sure enough, there was a rock rattlesnake um, really close to where the lizard was. And so we assumed that she was the one who had killed that lizard and was now coming to retrieve it. So with, with some prey items, um, especially something harder to hold onto, like a bird, um, rattlesnakes will hold on, you know, bite, they will strike them and then hold on to them and then just, you know, hold on to them while they're dying and swallow them. Um, but their usual method of hunting is to wait along a prey trail, strike something as it comes along and then let that animal kind of run off and die. So we've sort of learned over the years now with these observations that when we find an animal that doesn't appear to have any mark on them just laying there dead, there's a chance that that means that it was struck by a rattlesnake. And if you're patient, um, you might get to see that snake come and get. So that's what we were hoping would happen. So, so unfortunately, um, when I first um, spotted that rock rattlesnake next to the lizard, um, this species is especially shy and spooky um, for a rattlesnake or for snakes in general. And she's sort of like shot off away from the patio. And, um, you know, we kind of kept an eye on her and, you know, watched her sort of sniff around like, pretty clearly doing some behavior that looks like they're trying to pick up the trail of something, either another snake um, or in this case, um, the food item trying to figure out um, where, you know, where he ran from. And I imagine this is a much harder task to do when it's a lizard than if she was a mammal eating snake. Cause you know, like mammals are 
pretty stinky. <laughs> so I imagine they leave a much easier trail. And we watched her track around and this just shows how focused she was on that trail and finding the lizard that she actually crawled pretty pretty close to our feet and underneath the, the shade of our cameras several times as she was trying to make her way back to that food item. Um, but because for snakes, you know, they may only eat a few times uh, the whole year when they're awake, you know, they're um, probably pretty lucky to get a meal a month um, or a rattlesnake, I should say. Something like a garter snake is probably eating more often, but for rattlesnakes, meals are generally fewer and hard to come by. So they're going to do everything they can to try to find that prey item. And although they're not always successful, in this case, this snake did eventually find her lizard without um, help or further interference from us. <laughs> And, you know, lucky for us and and other people, um, some people that follow us on Facebook, because this all happened right outside our front door, um, when the snake, who we've come to call Carol, found the lizard, we were able to film that and share it on Facebook Live, which was kind of fun. <laughs> and usually a lot of your you know, really interesting wildlife observations take place when you're, you know, out in the wild, well away from good enough internet or cell phone coverage to be able to, to do something like that. So that's another cool thing about backyard observations and like building a wildlife friendly backyard is you can see this stuff like right at your place and you can share it with people in a way that's, you know, not that obtrusive to the animals because it's just, you know, it's just a camera for them, but they don't know that they're being watched by a thousand people online or whatever. <laughs> um, so this is obviously, or maybe not so obviously, but this has been sped up because the eating process for snakes, just like most everything else they do, is a little slow. Um, but if you've never seen it, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's it's interesting to see how she just goes right for that lizard, regardless of the ants, even though they do seem to kind of annoy her not enough to skip a meal again, because that those meals can be hard to come by. And so you're not going to pass them up. And, you know, she also, I'm sure, is still aware that we are pretty close by. Both of us were five or six feet away. Um, so as soon as she gets done swallowing, this part is not sped up. Um, she starts making her way off of the patio and, um, you know, away from us, trying to find a little, little safer place to be as soon as she can. So Carol basically uh, ate and ran. She went around the side of our house and immediately sort of holed up under some, some more cover, some more trash actually, and assumed this posture, which, you know, even though she ate for her size, a, a fairly decent meal, um, this is a, a pretty typical vertical hunting posture for a rock rattlesnake. Um, because they do eat a lot of lizards, um, one good way to catch lizards is by putting yourself in this vertical ambush position um, along a rock face so you can catch lizards running around at the top. And this is a picture of the piece of an old shelf, old metal cell, shelf or something that she's underneath and is up against those rocks on the, that's on the side of our garage. And that is where Carol spent the night. Um, so after we had, you know, watched the feeding event and followed her and watched her kind of settle in, um, you know, we had had a feeling the snake seemed even smaller than the rock rattlesnake that we had found under the truck bed liner the day before and had seen him there that morning. But 
but you know, we wanted to, to make sure. So since we now knew where this snake was, we went back and checked under the truck bed liner. And sure enough, rock rattlesnake number one was still under there. So now we had not one, but two rock rattlesnakes in our backyard. Just I like it was, it was so exciting. <laughs> just just so exciting. Um, and that's where they were at the, the end of that day, the second day. So morning of the third day, um, Carol, the rock rattlesnake that ate the lizard, she's still hanging out under that piece of trash alongside the garage, presumably appears to still be um, hunting again. Um, the rock rattlesnake that was under the truck bed liner uh, who we who we now call Daryl. Um, Daryl had left the truck bed liner and he was seen um, a little bit closer to the house, not quite where Carol was eating the lizard, but a pretty close and in and out of vegetations and kind of sniffing around. And so at this point, um, my partner Jeff and I are really after wanting to keep an eye on the snakes and see where they're going. Um, so. Another thing about rattlesnakes is that, you know, given they're the same age, females are usually smaller than males because when they reach sexual maturity, females devote pretty much all of their resources to their to their babies, to their developing babies in pregnancy, um, whereas males just keep growing. There's some exceptions to this, but for the most part, males are bigger. So. When you know we confirmed that we actually had two different snakes and noted that the second one, Carol, was much smaller than the first, Daryl, um, they were like, hmm, seems like this is probably a male and a female. There's also some tail differences on rattlesnakes. Um, the shape and the length of it is a little different between males and females. The heads are a bit wider relatively on male rattlesnakes than females which is really tough to tell in this species because they don't really have those big wide triangular shaped heads like a lot of the larger species of rattlesnakes do but we were pretty sure that um, we had a male and a female and given the first place we saw daryl on deal on day three was in that same area where carol had been the day before now we were thinking that what we had going on was not just, oh my God, we have a rock rattlesnake. Oh my God, we have two and one of them is eating on our front porch. But now maybe this male is after this female because this is also their breeding season. So yeah, so very excited and trying to keep tabs on these snakes as they move around. Um, and so Daryl's checking out patio this is close to where the lizard was he starts to he takes cover under the door into our um greenhouse we thought he was going to go inside but he never actually went all the way in he just kind of hid under it and uh, hid under it and peeked out at us um you know again he is also doing some scent trailing behavior and is so focused on that that just comes right next to our feet as we're trying to to film and this is pretty much the exact spot or one of the spots where carol was crawling around the day before as she was trying to pinpoint where that lizard was um he's checking out um some more uh artificial cover in our yard which is an old radiator that carol had also been near um and ends up kind of back in that same vegetation where we first saw him um, that morning um, to settle in for the night. Whereas Carol has actually not moved all day and is still under the same piece of trash and that same hunting posture to settle in for the night. So fourth day, pretty early. Um, Carol moved from the spot where she had been all day the day before um, to yet another piece of metal cover in our yard, not very far from the first. Um, and, and this posture like could be used for hunting. Her neck is in that, that curved shape that allows them to, to strike at a distance and do it pretty quickly. Um, but she also kind of looks like she's just chilling. 
Um, and given her behavior the day before, <laughs> given her behavior the day before, um, you know, we kind of figured she would probably just, you know, stay put and hang out. Also, you know, it's only been a day and a half since she had a, a pretty big meal. So um, we were checking on her intermittently and more paying attention to trying to keep an eye on Daryl. Um, so we almost missed this and actually missed the strike where she bit this tree lizard um, from that spot where she was in the previous photo. But my partner Jeff did did manage to notice as he was out there checking on her that, um, that this little lizard had fallen nearby her. Um, he didn't get very far after the strike. And so, man, in, in less than 48 hours, we got to watch the snake Carol <laughs> take down two lizards. It was, you know, we like the lizards in our yard, but you don't get to see snakes eat in the wild very often, even when you're spending all day, every day, following them around, like for research or whatever. It's just a very rare sighting, because like I said, they usually don't eat that often. Um, so to get to see it twice was was really, really exciting. Um, and also just great to see this snake doing so well, um, you know, and knowing that by providing habitat for all of the animals in our yard that, um, you know, we we're helping to keep the snake nice and healthy. Our little neighbor, Carol. funny two lizards in that short a period of time and she she still doesn't have anywhere near the belly that that garter snake did from the, the single meal so Car carol um after eating that lizard um settled settled nearby she's sitting underneath one of our rainwater tanks um just a just a couple feet away from where she ate that lizard daryl on the other hand was doing the opposite of sitting still. So while Carol was over there eating lizards and chilling out, Daryl was frantically searching for something. And at this point, we assume that he, he must be after Carol because he's doing that frantic scent trail searching behavior where they, they start to go somewhere and there's just a lot, a lot of tongue flicking. Um, and at one point he's crawling across our driveway and he's in almost exactly the same spot that Carol crawled across the day before. Fortunately, he is going the exact opposite direction that Carol crossed the day before. So he's actually headed the wrong way um, back toward our garden at this point instead of toward Carol. I guess the trail is not gone. Obviously, he smells something, um, but he's having a, a bit of a trouble after that much time to to get a good direction on it. And lucky for him, at this point, even though this is our rainy season and that was a pretty good rainy year, there hasn't been any rain um, since these two. Or, you know, at this point in time, not now uh, in 2020. But at this point in time, there hadn't been any rain since. Um, this little rock rattlesnake soap opera began. That does make it um, probably easier on the smell front, but certainly harder on the snakes out on a gravel driveway in the intense August sun at 6,500 feet. Um, I imagine he got pretty hot doing that. Um, but, you know, finding females is art. That's even harder to come by than finding food. So the males seem to be pretty determined to find one when they get a whiff of one, um, as much so as they are when they've struck something and want to eat it. So the next day, Carol, um, who's just a little eating machine, has moved a short distance away, kind of downhill a little bit from a rainwater tank and is now in another vertical hunting posture, this time on the side of this um, pine tree stump 
um, again hunting, which we were just like, wow, I cannot believe the snake is hunting again. But on the other hand, she's busy hunting, so she's probably going to stay there. We can focus on keeping track of Daryl. Um, that turned out not to be the case. Carol did not stay there that long. Um, she kind of took off downhill shortly thereafter. Um, again, appeared to be looking for something. Um, we'd even wondered at the time if maybe, you know, we had missed her striking something else um, because she just, the way that she was sort of like crawling back and forth and, and not just going in one direction. And again, lots of tongue flicking and, and just exploring, but um, yeah, I mean, where she, where she ended up, it wasn't clear why she wasn't clear at the time why she took such a circuitous circuitous path, but she really did. Um, and then here comes Daryl. Once again, um, a bit behind Carol, but starting to get close up, um, <laughs> sniffing around. It was it was at times like, you know, really frustrating to see him get so close and sometimes even right at the exact spot where she was. And you could see him get, you know, really interested, like when he got to that stump where she had spent some time and, you know, his tongue flicks increase and you just, you do really are tempted to pick him up and carry him over to where she is, but we didn't do that. Um, you know, we just we just watched his progress. Um, you know, of course, really hoping that he would eventually find her. And you know, after several days of getting pretty lucky, um, this is the night as he's searching for Carol when you know, we finally get a lot of rain and. You know, the storm seemed to startle him a bit at first, but like most snakes, he, he then took advantage of the falling rain to drink some water off of his coils, which hopefully you were able to, to see that for a second in the video. Um, and then he was right back at it, um, going through the vegetation, trying to pick up her scent. Um, it really seemed apparent to Jeff, who was the one tracking him at the time, that he was he was having some some trouble and was really not enjoying himself out in the rain. Um, we had lost track of of Carol. We don't know where she had ended up. She kind of gave us the slip earlier, and so we were, we were really trying to stay on Daryl to figure out, <laughs> hoping he would find her for us. And you know, as the as the night ended. Um, you know, because it was just getting late and Daryl wasn't settling down and it was raining and cold and you know, finally just had to bid him good night and hope we'd be able to find them the next day. But um, honestly, when we went to bed that night, we were kind of um, sort of resigned to the fact that that was probably our last day with them because it, they're just I'll show you some pictures at the end. Um, you know, it's like they're right in our yard, but it's just amazing how uh, easy they were to to lose in what little vegetation we have there. So luck, I don't know, um, but Jeff almost immediately found Daryl um, the next morning, not very far from where he was last tracking him the night before he seemed to be trying to to warm up a bit probably got pretty cold the night before in the in the rain and storm and so at this point it's all up to daryl we don't know exactly where carol is um so i'm not sure that jeff ate that day i think he just stayed outside following the snake around and there was one point in following him, you know, again, you'd, you'd see him, we'd seen him in the past when he got close to the places where she, where she had been that you could, you could see him kind of get excited and more tongue flicking. Um, and, you know, initially this day, he started going back to some of those spots back closer to the house, or at least to spots we knew she had been um, under some of those same cover, the, the pine tree stump where she had hunted 
and these this metal and this piece of board which is where she caught the second lizard the tree lizard and seemed to check those out almost like he was sort of backtracking trying to to go back to places where he knew she was and see if he could pick up the trail from there but you know we'd gotten a lot of rain um so just you know wasn't sure if is it possible for a snake to pick up a trail of another snake or anything else after all that? We don't know, but Daryl was pretty determined. Again, just crawling and even touching our shoes as he goes by just, you know, on Carol's trail. At some point during the day of him tracking, he seems to be less um, wandering and back and forth. And I mean, you can almost see the moment when he really gets her scent and kind of narrow in, narrows in and sort of like pinpoints the direction and starts to go a little faster, which is really exciting. Cause again, we don't know where she is. <laughs> um, so we're just fo following him and hoping for the best. Yeah, so we think based on his behavior at this point, he is he is back on her trail. He started to crawl back over some of the places where we knew she had been and then eventually takes off in that same direction we had last seen her going, but in a new spot to us and comes up to just this this giant downed log in our yard and like determinedly goes through it and out on the other side. Miss Carol. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so we actually got some footage of the moment after, you know, to our knowledge, at least six days that Daryl has been looking for, and it could have been much longer because who knows how long he was chasing her before they ended up in our yard under our watch, um, you know, of him, of him finding the female. And we've been lucky enough to see courtship between rattlesnakes in the wild um, in several species and on several occasions, although I think this is the only time we've seen that initial male finding the female and certainly the only time we've watched them chase each other around for all that time. And, um, you know, we don't know for sure, but based on comparing this to observations with other snakes um the behavior that carol is doing with her tail with it flipped back like that and and wiggling it a little bit but she's she's not rattling um makes it seem like she's she's receptive to daryl she's very interested in him um what we've seen with with some courting rattlesnakes in the past is as the male is sniffing around and when they start doing the the chin rubbing behavior to um um which is one of the ways that they show they're communicating to the female with um pheromones that they are interested in her and sometimes you'll see the females like actually hit the males in the face with their with their tail and it's it's kind of a violent like flipping the tail back and forth um quite different than the rattling behavior and it it really looks like the, the females are saying, no, they're not interested. And this wasn't what we were seeing with, with Carol at all. Um, it, was a, it was a very different behavior and, and she's not trying to move away. And yeah, I think um, someone made the comment that it looks like Daryl's licking her. And so with snakes, a lot of their communication, as far as we know, um, most all of their communication is through sense and pheromone. So, so that tongue flicking is, you know, him trying to read, not just, is this a rock rattlesnake? Is this a female rock rattlesnake? But he can probably smell whether or not she's interested in him. That probably is a slightly different pheromone than one she's giving off if she was 
pregnant or just not that into them or just not that into them right now. So you do see a lot of increased tongue flicking um, when two snakes meet for any reason. And I think that's part of, you know, their way of, of checking each other out in the same way that, um, you know, more visually oriented animals like us kind of look people over, try to read facial expressions, or they might talk verbally or, you know, communicate verbally for non-human animals. But with snakes, you see a lot of tongue flicking and that chin rubbing thing is also probably way much like cats rub their faces on stuff to put their scent on things. And that probably helps with snake communication too. So this ended with Daryl and Carol together under that stump. And at this point, we were really excited that they had found each other. We got to see, you know, several days, um, well, we got to see two feeding observations, several days of Daryl tracking Carol. And, you know, we tried to be as careful as we could not to disturb them, but that's that's just not 100% possible. They They view us as a threat, and I know that they knew we were nearby the whole time. Um, so we really wanted to, at this point, um, leave them alone as much as possible. So instead of hanging out in a couple lawn chairs with them, which was tempting, um, we we set up one of our remote time lapse cameras. So the so now this film footage is jerky because it's supposed to be jerky because it's time lapse, um, and just got you know a little bit more of a peek into the courtship process. A lot of times with rattlesnakes, the pairs will stay together for days or even weeks. Sometimes they'll split up for a while and, and then a couple weeks the male will come back. Um, in this case, that didn't happen. At least they didn't stay in one spot. There was that little storm that you just saw and then they disappeared seemingly under the log, but that was actually the last time we saw Daryl and Carol, <laughs> um, which was a little bittersweet um, based on, you know, our knowledge that oftentimes the pairs stay together for long periods of time. You know, we we had hoped that we get to see them just hanging out for another week, but you know, that's okay that they didn't. They probably moved off to another, another spot that was, maybe they wanted a bit more privacy. Um, and that's cool because we'd already gotten to see so much stuff. So, you know, this is snake study question mark because, um, you know, kind of the first thing you learn when you're working on or designing a science project is sample size and that you need, you know, big sample size to be able to, to say anything. Um, but, you know, sometimes, well, I've heard this, I've heard this stated a couple of different ways. You know, data is are just the plural of anecdotes, which is what this is. This is an anecdotal story that I just told you. It wasn't a wasn't a designed study. There were only two animals involved doing very different things. Um, but we got we got to observe them doing a lot of cool things that, frankly, we wouldn't have gotten to see on a large scale study. Um, and and I think that that's important and overlooked and and honestly just it's it's just a lot of fun and i think for trying to get more people to be excited about watching snakes in the same way that we watch and enjoy backyard birds or you know some people like seeing squirrels show up in their yard or raccoons or whatever you know you can have a lot of fun just watching a couple of snakes even if it isn't you know like groundbreaking science, but but sometimes it is. Sometimes you do end up seeing things that are really important and unique. And so the reason I have this photo up now that you've seen now about 10 times during the presentation. So this was this was taken during that courtship period after Daryl found Carol. And what is not that noticeable until you know the whole story is this is actually both snakes. So this is Daryl. Um, stacked on top of Carol. So stacking is a behavior um, that I think is unique to rattlesnakes. I've never heard anyone describe it with any with any other um, species of snakes, but basically it's a it's a type of mate guarding, we think. So once a male finds a female 
and she seems receptive to him. He's, he's basically covering his body with her. I mean, you can just barely see her rattle sticking out at one point. That's her rattle. That's not his. And just a little bit of her body. Um, but, you know, she's pretty well hidden. Maybe it's also doing something to hide her smell from other males. But, but we think this is a form of, of mate guarding that, that, again, hasn't been documented that many times, um, probably because a lot of people assume if you don't disturb the animals that there's only one snake sitting here because it's really hard to tell there too. So um, Jeff and I and through our organization Advocates for Snake Preservation, um, you know, one of the things we try to encourage with people, like I said, is that, you know, it can be really fun to, to watch snakes. Um, it's, it's so much more enjoyable to see them in the wild than to be messing with captives. I mean, captive snakes are cool and everything, but it's just so much cooler to have one in your yard or get to see one out on the trail. And, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot is that you get to see them do cooler stuff when you leave them alone. As soon as you get close to a snake, like happened with Carol the very first day, um, or especially if you pick them up or, you know, touch them with a tool or anything, is that you're after, after that point, you're pretty much just seeing defensive behavior because they are so scared of us because we're, you know, predators to them. We're bigger than them. Um, so this was a, a good opportunity for us, you know, even though it was very, very tempting with the first one, there were a lot of places, there were a lot of times during this where it was very tempting to want to handle the snakes or paint their rattles so we could identify them later or, you know, measure them or pick Daryl up and carry him over to Carol or, you know, whatever, um, throw the mouse at Carol so she could eat it. And, you know, that, but we didn't, we did, you know, kind of practice what we preached. You know, we stood back as, as far as we possibly could while trying to keep up with these tiny little rattlesnakes, um, you know, use cameras sometimes that we would just leave when the snake was sitting there, um, focused on the snakes and just walk away um, using our binoculars. And, you know, that was how we got this footage. And it was, it was not, it was not easy. Rock rattlesnakes are so small. And even though, you know, you, where you normally encounter them are in these rocky areas and looking at the snakes, that is where they look like they would be very hard to find. You know, they, they look like rocks. Um, even when they're crawling across a pretty open area like this fire break, they're still hard to see. And when they got into the grass, you could lose them when they were just a few feet away. What was also interesting for us, um, as we were following this pair around, I, I think I mentioned earlier that this species has a reputation for being very shy and very spooky. And most people I know when they go out looking for rock rattlesnakes, you're generally being loud and hoping that one is scared enough to rattle because otherwise you'll just never see them. They generally, they rattle and they dive into rocks um, in the rocky areas where you usually encounter them. And I would have thought a few years ago that this might be impossible to follow some around like this, but it was really interesting. I mean, there were there were times when, you know, they were following food trails or when Daryl was following Carol's trail that they were really focused on that. And so they didn't seem that disturbed by us. But even when they weren't doing those behaviors, they they seemed to even over the course of a few days because we hadn't touched them and we're trying to stay pretty far away that um, just seemed to calm down. There was far less rattling after the first two days. There was there was almost none. I mean, they just really seemed to be going about their business and and kind of ignoring us, which was which was very cool. I hope that doesn't necessarily carry over to every person they meet. I imagine, you know, that goes away once everybody leaves that situation. But it was really interesting to see in a species that has a reputation for just, you know, being completely unapproachable. Um, yeah, like I said, they, they got, you know, very close to us at times um, and we generally just set still, still enough as it felt within within reason. <laughs> we don't want it to be safe um, as well, but the snakes were generally much more concerned with either 
finding their next meal, finding their next hiding spot, or in Daryl's case, finding Carol than they were with, you know, anything to do with us or our various um, yard decorations, which also kind of look like snakes. <laughs> So um, that's all I got for the presentation. So I will get out of this screen and go back to camera. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Melissa. That was great. I'm impressed that you were hanging out with the the rattlesnakes with bare feet. I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm a bit scared, as you can see from some of the comments. I'm not alone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the I mean, I was actually going to ask you. So they just sort of got used to you, so they ended up really not seeing you as a threat. I it it kind of seemed that way. I mean, we were staying we were staying back, and every every picture were close to our feet or our equipment. Um, that was because they turned around and approached us and we just mm -hmm. stayed still. If my feet had been on the ground with the snake, I, I wouldn't have let them get that close because it's just, uh, I, I think it probably most of the time would be fine. There's no reason why they would just crawl up to a foot and bite it. Like that doesn't, mm -hmm. there's no way that would benefit them. Um, but it's not worth the risk. Uh, snake bites are very expensive to treat and they're very painful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So um, there are a few questions. One was just asking about your organization. Are you targeting particular snakes for snake preservation or is it uh, snakes in general? That, yeah, that's a good question. So yeah. we don't focus on threatened and endangered species like a lot of group. Um, our our purpose is it, it's a bit more broader than that. So mm. Jeff and I worked in sort of traditional wildlife biology and wildlife conservation for a long time. And most of those research projects were in, in public areas like national parks or developments, you know, trying to see what the effect of prescribed fire or a new golf course was on snakes and other animals that lived there. And whenever we talked to people, because, you know, we had like radio telemetry equipment or something, you know, we looked interesting. So they always wanted to know what we were doing. Hmm. And people would approach us and we would tell them, we're like, oh, we're look, we're studying rattlesnakes and just the looks we would get. And, you know, it, at best, people usually expressed apathy mm -hmm. and the worst, but a pretty common response was, well, wouldn't it be good if fire killed all the snakes or the golf course killed all the snakes? <laughs> So, so what we realized was all the science looking at the effects of this and that on an animal that's so misunderstood and disliked as snakes um, is not really going to be effective unless the public is receptive to it. Because to, to really do conservation, you need public support and a lot of time public involvement, depending on what it is. So, so we started this organization to give snakes a better reputation and make them more understood and more familiar in general. So that's why we don't focus on specific species um, for preservation. We're trying to give them all a boost. Great, thanks. A few other questions have popped up. Um, are banded rock rattlesnakes a subspecies of mottled or the other way around? These two were banded ra rock rattlers, correct? These are banded rock rattlesnakes, yes. So. Um, so rock rattlesnakes, that's, that's the species name. And then banded rocks and modeled are two, two subspecies. There might even be more subspecies okay. of that. Um, yeah, but rock rattlesnakes are the species. Okay. Um, are there any particular snakes that are endangered? Um, yeah, there's a host of them. So let's see in the U S I know I'm going to miss some, uh, okay. I just watched a webinar from Texas Park and Wildlife on a water snake species that's endemic to Texas and, and might be federally listed. Um, what's it called? Snake, I think. Um, Brazos. Uh, thank you. That's what it, yeah, that's the one. Hmm. 
And San Francisco garter snakes, which are a subspecies of common garter snake, they are um, they're federally listed as an, as an endangered subspecies. Um, New Mexico ridge nose rattlesnakes, and there are also two other species of garter snakes in the southwest that are federally threatened, and those are narrow-headed garter snakes and um, Mexican garter snakes. Okay, so there's quite a few then. Yeah, yeah, there's quite a few. I, worldwide, there are some that are that are much rarer than those mm -hmm. even. Those are the ones off. I mean, a lot of those are local or species yeah. that I've worked sure. with. But. What, what's the lifespan of a rock rattler typically? Good question. Uh, we don't know a lot about lifespan of any snakes in the wild because they're generally not studied long enough to know. You can, mm. there, um, it takes snakes, most snakes, at least that I'm aware of, all of them, um, several years to reach adult size. But you are really working with a population a lot. Um, even know how, even knowing how long it takes them to reach adult size is something that you mm. don't <laughs> you don't often know. And then once they're adult size, it's possible to age them. So on some long term studies, and the closest I can think of to a rock rattlesnake would be with with timber rattlesnakes in the eastern U.S. And those snakes have been known. Um, to live maybe 50 years, possibly even Ooh. more. Wow. Yeah, there have been some marked at dens that were, were marked when they were at least 10 years old and then mm. 30 years later. Oh, um, wow. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I it yeah, it is it is surprising. They um you know I imagine like a lot of wildlife, most of them don't make it past the first year because you're trying to figure out what to do. Everybody eats you. <laughs> <laughs> but once you get to be that old, so average lifespan is probably pretty short, but once you get to be mm. an adult and have your stuff figured out, then you can probably live a really long time. Great. Um, someone asked, can snakes climb stairs? I believe they can. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Yes, they can climb stairs. Um, yeah. Again, if it had looked like Daryl was going to come up the stairs, I would have moved. But we just shared a, a video a week ago of a black tail rattlesnake crawling all the way up that same set of stairs. We were not there when he did that. It's all this is a much bigger species of rattlesnake, but yeah, they can climb. Yeah. Well, I've seen rat, rat snakes going straight up a side of a tree, so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Some. Yeah. yeah. A lot of snakes are excellent climbers. Mm. Rattlesnakes are on the not as great climbers, but mm. stairs. Stairs are easy. Okay. That's what I thought. Good. Okay. Um, I think that's most of the questions. Anybody got any other questions at all? You can come on audio if you want, or type it out. Yeah. And thank you, Ruth Ann. Mm. Yeah. the link if anyone's interested of state and federally listed reptiles and amphibians in Texas. Great. Right. 